Good afternoon, everybody, and you're very welcome to today's seminar in the Centre for uh, Applied Linguistics and Multilingualism in NUI Galway. I'm John Walsh, one of the Centre co-directors, and my other co-director, Stasha Antonievich, is here today. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to our seminar for today, which is entitled From Fireside Stories to Bounded Texts, Examining the Dialogic Pro Process of a Major Irish Language Folklore Collection. And the presenter is Dr. Marion Nivoyline from NUI Galway. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, Marion, uh, who's joining us from the Aran Islands today, where she's from. And Marion has a PhD in Modern Irish and Anthropology from Maynooth University, and she taught Irish for many years in that university. And she also spent um, many years as a linguist working with an Aboriginal community in Western Australia and is currently working in the Department of Speech and Language Therapy in NUI Galway on a project about assessment of narrative in children attending Gaeltacht and non Gaeltacht Irish medium schools. And Marion will speak for about 40 minutes, and then we have about 20 minutes left for questions. Marcin Tommy, the Falter Oath of Arian, Huit Kam and Uv, Falter Oath of Stomach to Sul Gamur, let the Huit Kainte. Gurmil Mada John Gurmil Mada, the man saw the vote and shot over a mask in you. And thank you to the Moore Institute and to the Centre for Applied Linguistics and Multilingualism for allowing me the opportunity to present my work today. Thank you especially to Stasha and to John and to Matthew behind the scenes. Um, also, a thank you to Kisa McCarthy in UCD for allowing me access to the material in the first place and also to some of the pictures that I'll show today. Um, this work is based on my PhD thesis that I submitted way back in 2016 and enter family life and a cross-continental move and I'm finally getting back into um, into hopefully um, preparing the stories for publication. So I will share my screen and share my presentation with you. Okay, so from Fireside Stories to Bounded Text, the stories of Tharuk Odziran. House was a little bit slow, it seems. Okay, so the interdisciplinary approach to the collection was born out of my background in the subjects modern Irish and linguistic anthropology. An Irish linguistic and perhaps a more traditional approach to the collection is to take the manuscript form, this here the text, as a starting point for analysis. In other words, the text is analyzed for its rich linguistic and sociolinguistic content. A linguistic anthropological approach, on the other hand, views the text as a process and is more interested in the context of narration and collection, in the pragmatics, and in the underlying social, socio-historical discourses that frame a folklore text. Of course, both approaches overlap in that linguists um, or linguistics is always interested in linguistic context, and likewise, an examination of the social and cultural aspect of folklore is informed by the content of a folklore text. And it's this overlapping of content and context um, is what makes anthropology and Irish the perfect combination for this analysis of a folklore text. Um, in taking this inter interdisciplinary approach to the Flower Odzidon collection, I'm heeding the advice of Zilmodo Gillon, who calls for a closer relationship between the two ethnological traditions that have long worked in Ireland, folklore and anthropology. And also Richard Bauman, who um, in the 1970s called for a reorientation from the traditional focus upon folklore as an item, the things of folklore or the texts, to conceptualization of folklore as an event, the doing of folklore or a process. So a very quick overview. Um, I will first introduce the collector Robin Flower, the storyteller Dar Hozidam, and then I'll mainly focus on the collection itself and describe parts of the editing process involved in producing an edited and annotated text from handwritten, semi-phonetically transcribed folklore material. Where possible, I'll incorporate some linguistic examples that will give a glimpse into the narrator's dialect. And then lastly, the anthropological analysis will be confined to the storytelling scene and viewing the narration event as performance.
I'm sorry, my mouse is um, playing up a little bit, so I'm trying different things here. Okay, Robin Flower. Robin Flower, 1881 to 1946, was a renowned medievalist scholar, more generally associated with the Blasket Islands in County Kerry. After graduating in 1904 with a degree in classics from Pembroke, Oxford, Flower worked at the British Museum from 1906 onwards, where he was employed as deputy keeper of manuscripts. It was while cataloguing the museum's vast collection of Irish manuscripts that Flower, the Robin Flower gained an in-depth knowledge of Old and Middle Irish and was encouraged to take classes in modern Irish in both London and Dublin. In Dublin, he was taught by the Norwegian Celtic scholar, um, Karl Marstrander, who advised Flower to study spoken Irish in the Great Blasket. In 1910, Robin Flower made the first of many visits to the Blasket Islands, where he worked with Peg Sears and Thomas de and became widely respected for the substantial contribution to Irish and Blasket scholarship. The Blasket Islanders bestowed the pet name Blohi, or Little Flower, upon him, and although Flower hadn't returned for some years before his death, his ashes were scattered on the island, and so it became his final resting place. On what is believed to be his only visit to the Aran Islands, Robin Flower visited Inishmore in 1933 during the making of the first ever Irish language film with sound, Ia Hanachish, A Night of Storytelling. Directed by Robert Flaherty, Ia Hanachish was made as a curtain raiser to the better known Man of Aran film and depicted storyteller Shawnee Tom or Zidon sitting by the fireside narrating a story to a small assembled audience. The audience, of course, being the cast of the Man of Aran film. So here we have uh, Maggie Tom. Um, Maggie Tom, Mikey Delan, uh, Pat Rua, Tiger King, Shani Tom would sit on, and then um, Robert Flaherty and James Ogilarga here, and of course over here is Robin Flower. So I'll talk a bit more about this picture in a second, but um, Robin Flower seems came to the island to meet with the film's director, um, Robert Flaherty, and from the Ia Hanachish correspondence file, it seems that he assisted Odilargo, who was tasked with finding a suitable storyteller who could not only perform, but who also looked good on camera, so to speak. So following a long selection process that involved local narrators, including Thar Hodzidon, who was briefly considered for the role, um, and a Connemara storyteller who was actually chosen for the role, but who passed away shortly before he was due to travel to London. Eventually, Shani Tam Hodzidon was selected for the starring role. And this picture was in fact um, not taken in Aaron at all, but on the Ia Hanachish set in Gainsborough Studio, London, where sound was added to the Man of Aaron film and where Ia Hanachish was shot in its entirety. Um, so we know from the correspondence file that Robert Flower was in Aaron during the shooting of Man of Aaron and for the selection process of the storyteller. And then when the cast and crew were in London, so in this instance here, to record the sound for Man of Aaron, and to shoot Ia Hanachish, Robin Flower came to the set to visit them at Gainsborough Studios, where this picture was taken. And there's a wonderful background story that I won't go into today here, but um, to the film itself, Ia Hanachish, and which had been lost for decades and diligently researched and searched for by scholars, including Jim Cohan. Um, and then in, I think it was 1912, I'm sure somebody would correct me if that's not right, a lone nitrate copy was found by chance during a re-cataloging of Harvard University Library in 2012, I think. It has since been restored and shown at various locations, including Harvard University, Dublin um, Irish Film Institute, and most importantly of all, Hala Ronan in Inishmore. So fascinating as the whole story of Ia Hanachish is, I really only mention it here today because of Robin Flower's involvement and the fact that Dara Hood did almost himself briefly the storyteller of this collection was briefly considered for the role um, of storyteller for this film here. Dara Hudziram, known locally as Dara Nedefadi, was from the village of Onacht in Arin, Orinish Moor, the largest of the Aran Islands. He was a farmer, a fisherman, a cobbler and a storyteller. And he was born circa 1876 and died in January 1950. And I say circa here, um, because when I was researching the storyteller, I found that many of the official records, including the school registry, the 1901 census, the 1911 census, and the parish record of death, neither of them corresponded with the official date of birth. Um, and I, I know that there's, um, there were reasons to 
the reasons for this that we can probably discuss at, at the end, but um, we could talk a long time about these dates and the research involved, but I think the, the circa here would just would suffice for now to reference the, the discrepancies found. In the mid-2000s, I interviewed a number of local people in Lauren who were either related to the storyteller or, or who had personal recollections of him. And each of the eight respondents, including Ozidon's daughter, Kate, who was by then in her mid-80s, referred to him as Dara Nedefadi or Dara Ozidon. Nobody is Mach Dara and nobody is Dara either, but he referred to himself in the stories as Dara, which is why I eventually chose this um, version of his name. Only one person had heard of him referred to as the um, by the moniker the fairy cobbler and saying Shane Talma Hubach Nistranchari at Fairy Cobbler, which is the name the visitors called him, was Fairy Cobbler. Many attested to, to Zidon's great skill as a cobbler and all knew of him as an accomplished storyteller, some saying that the stories were handed down through the generations, while others said that he created his own. I'd imagine it was a combination of both. Amongst other items of information to emerge was his ability to swim, a uh, fact confirmed by Morrison and Zidon, and his skill at making little dolls from kipney or small little sticks. So there is the man himself. And another nice um, image of him here. On the quay at Kilmervy, these are some, some quotes referring to Zidon from eminent folklores of the day, including Seamus de Larga. On the quay at Kilmervy met the fairy cobbler, Dara Hood Zidon, who has a large number of tales and willing to record. The fairy cobbler who told you stories when you were here, we do not think is a good enough type. That's in relation to the Ian film. And that's Robert Prati to add of Mar, Mar. And thank you to Deirdre Nechamila for um, directing me to this quote and many others. Random notes made in Aaron 1944, during the months of July, August and September 1944, my informants were, and she goes down through the list, number three is Dara Ozidon, 68, circa 68, Olnach. This is actually the only one that um, corresponds with the official date of birth of all records, this one here by Maud and Inye. By way of being a shkili, Robin Flower recorded from him, visitors often brought to him, speaks slowly and distinctly, farmer and fisherman, Maud and Inye. The first of these notes accompanied a story submitted to the folklore collection by local school teacher Joseph of Flanagan. And he says um, that Makdara Uzidan gave him this story in January the 12th, 1931. He himself heard it from an old woman of the Uzidan clan um, who died um, around 10 years ago in, at the age of 79. It's Mosh of Skala of Flanagan. And this nice piece here, Shanachi Farshkale at the Skinal Thalts of Avi and Dara Huzidon. That's from the poet Morton Huzidon. So that says Dara Huzidon was a Shanachi, a recounter of lore, you know, uh, which is a Shanachi, a man of stories, and a type of philosopher. And Morton Huzidon wrote this lovely poem in his honor, um, I think about five, six years after his death. I think it was published in 1958 and he died in 1950. Um, so I'll, I'll read it in Irish and if I can, um, I'll, I'll point to the English part, but that mightn't work for very long, so we'll see how I go. Cain scale a hara on seed ood hall, er casu shawning earth no shame was false. And will mockery aid in heen to naught, and will fill my cool not come on on, and run chalach fera root to road. Squeal hugging the hood, this the scale a hara hood. What is the hoodish ood or hot? Ach dogish is she, fain can task. Fod arin, fod arin a hara gobeo, is adish doon gach achter a gart. Ach boilum mora, kim wavalak, on fod mulain with the veil go back. And as you can see, Udzidam is a very common surname in Aaron as well, uh, the poet Dara Udzidam not related as far as I know, or if he's not closely related to Dara Ozidon. This Shawnee Tom Ozidon here is another Ozidon, that's the storyteller that they're referring to. So this here, did you meet Shawnee yet or Seamus? That's referring to Shawnee Tom Ozidon, the storyteller from Ia Hanlachish. His friend Seamus O'Flartha, Seamus James O'Flartha, and then the school teacher that was mentioned in the previous slide, uh, Shows of Athanagan, all three of them drowned 
on their way back from um, pilgrimage in Pope Patrick in 1939, the last, the last day of July, 1939. So he's asking him here, um, has he seen them yet? Has he seen any of the characters from his stories? Um, and there's just various indexical relations to his local persona, you know, let us know. Um, I inquired after you from Cots, that's his wife, Cots Vikilwatu. Come to our aid, Daurach, and narrate every adventure correctly for us. So it's a beautiful poem and full of um, indexical relations, as, a, as I said. The collection itself, Robin Flowers, nah, um, sorry, first of all, we don't have a huge amount of contextual information for the collection insofar as it wasn't recorded in the same meticulous fashion as the school's collection or the works of individual folklore collectors who submitted to the Folklore Commission at the time. Um, in those instances, it was certain contextual details were called for, um, such as name of collector, date of collection, name and age of narrator, method of recording, whether it was on edophone, et cetera. And uh, Robert Flower, of course, wasn't officially associated with the IFC and so collected his material in the Blasket and in Ishmore outside of the professional folklore collecting project. In the case of this collection, it seems that he availed of the opportunity to collect material while on the island during the shooting of Man of Aaron. So instead, what we have for this collection is a number of notes which I will show you in just a minute. But the collection is preserved in Robin Flowers' Nachlas in the National Folklore Collection and is written entirely in Flowers' handwriting. It contains 56 components, uh, 300 pages, mostly pen and some written in pencil. The entire collection is narrated by Dar Hud Zidam and the stories are a mixture of some long hero tales, a number of shorter pieces, often with an adventure or comical or sometimes a religious theme. In keeping with the genre of folk tales, humans interact with magical beings, animals are as likely to speak as people, and conceptions of time, space, and distance don't always correspond with our non-folk tale expectations. Um, I'll actually return to the uh, classification at the end if we have time, but some, I think about seven or eight of the stories can be classified under um, the international classification of folk tales and there are also some international motifs to be found as well. But interestingly five of the stories were rewritten and edited by Flower himself in a separate notebook and these are referred to as uh, version one and version two throughout my annotated edition. The collection, uh, the collection notes here we have um, I'm going to just rush down through this because I just uh, just seen the time. So, manuscript collection made by Robin Flower and Corona and Kilmervy Aaron Moore. The first two um, are by Seamus O'Dillarga. The next two, um, Robin Flower himself. Uh, these two here, and this I just draw attention to this. So he he says it's largely illegible, um, and Buanquist, however. So, he says that the stories are so extremely well told tales and he says although Robin Flower's handwriting is quite difficult to read um, that they're not in fact legible which I agree with and um, he states the importance that the importance of the collection and says that they should be edited for publication by someone with an in-depth knowledge of Ozidon's dialect. So this is it. This is an example of the, the collection, the, the writing. And I tried my best to, um, when I zoomed in any further than that, I just lost all focus. So it's a good indication of a lot of the material. So even though it's quite difficult to decipher at times, um, Robin Flower transcribed what he did on speech so precisely and with an incredible attention to phonetic detail that multiple dialect features can actually be gleaned from this material once, once um, deciphered. Now I'll, I'll return to uh, that page again in, in a minute or one of the pages, but the objectives of the editing method are quite simple when it comes down to it is to remain faithful to the narrator's dialect 
and then also to allow the text to be accessible to not only to linguists and to dialectologists, but to a general readership. Sorry, I'm really struggling with the mouse here. It's not doing what I want me to do. So, okay. Um, now, the standard modern Irish orthographical conventions, um, I used Fuckler Gaelgeber O'Donnell, and importantly, also, um, sorry, importantly, not only those items listed, listed as headwords, but also those marked with the equal sign, which allows a lot more scope for linguistic diversity. Um, and still, though, allows the reader not familiar with Aaron or Kramara Irish to easily locate the word. So, for example, if there's if a Amorach is in the dictionary, and then a Amorach might be listed as a variant, I think it is listed as a variant. Um, so that way, I could keep a Amorach, which is Ozidon's version, and which is what was recorded by Robin Flower, because if uh, now that's quite simple, so obviously somebody will know that. Um, but this one, if it's marked with an equal, so Mada, he, he says Mada, which is, of course, common in Kanmara and Aran Irish. Um, and this is included as, not as a variant, but with an equal sign. So if you go to Mada in the dictionary, it'll say equals Mada. So we also um, decided to, to use those in the edited text. So anything, a headword or anything listed as a variant or with an equal sign or anything as Furish and Fuckle as Gaila, another uh, Dewaldra publication, um, which listed words that weren't, that are not available in the main dictionary. Um, that's what we, that's what was decided upon to, to use here. Uh, for Grand of the it's Little of the that was an indispensable resource, of course, um, is the primary source for modernizing the pre-standard spelling, uh, often used by Flower and gives a very comprehensive account of every alteration. So I follow that as well with, with the editing process. Although not discussing the linguistic analysis here today, it's important to show some of the main sources used as many of the editorial decisions were made in accordance with these works on the Irish of Connemara and or Aaron. And basically the linguistic analysis consisted of an examination of the various speech parts in relation to how they correspond with or diverge from either the standard forms or the accepted dialect forms. And the accepted dialect forms are those that are mentioned in the body of work relating to Aran or Connemara Irish. Now the editing method, um, the order of, with these, with the objectives in mind, you know, accessibility and um, sorry now, the, um, to remain faithful to the narrator's dialect and then accessibility for the readership, I began the editing process. The order of stories were left as they were, the titles when included obviously weren't altered at all. And when there wasn't a title, which is the case in many of the stories, I added a simple descriptive title in square brackets, indicating that it was my own edition, but allowing the reader quick access to a particular story. So I might just say, um, um, a man in London long ago, which was uh, what the story was about. So I wrote that in square brackets. Paragraph formatting was limited so as not to disrupt the presumed flow of the old Zidon speech. Limited punctuation was added, limited in the sense that exclamation points or anything that presumed any paralinguistic features such as tone or pitch weren't inserted. Inverted commas or quotation marks were used to mark direct speech. And this in itself served to delineate the text as many of the stories had various character voices throughout. Parentheses, Parentheses were used for the narrator's voice outside of his storytelling persona, and this only happened very occasionally when he would step outside of his narrator role and explain something possibly in response to a question from the collector Robin Flower. And I'll discuss this if we have time again and um, towards the end, the meta-narration um, techniques used. Some of the decisions relating to the orthography were straightforward and some required quite a bit of research and analysis to ensure that in applying a seemingly simple orthographic amendment that I wasn't in fact altering the morphology of the word. So some of the um, more straightforward amendments were in certain accents were omitted or omitting surplus um, acute accents, expanding abbreviations. And then the use of footnotes was an essential tool in allowing access to the original item. Here, um, 
is an example of um, the more straightforward alterations in one sense, and that is just adding a father where omitted. Um, and likewise, um, um, sorry, I'm just trying to, okay. Um, so, so just, um, I'll just take one of these here. Um, these are quite straightforward. So if you, you know that it's not gonna be pronounced pe, um, it'll always be pe. Likewise, there's no reason why it would be called ni or, or hill, it would always be ni or heel. So there's no question about any of those and they're all in the literature. There's no indication that they were pronounced with short vowels. But for example, if there was arm here, um, there was arm in the sense of the shortened version of agam, but if there was arm with a father, that would be significant um, in that, the linguistic trait of elongation, a short vowel that precedes a nasal or liquid consonant to a long vowel or diphthong. So for example, om can be pronounced om, uh, kyle, kal, gal, gal, and slam as slam. So those particular instances are, are um, mentioned in the, the literature on Aaron and Connemara Irish. So in those cases, um, every token would be counted. Um, an example of om, 20, which occurs 20 times in the edited text. And then in the manuscript, LS is lost reading manuscript, um, arm 20 and arm, it didn't occur once. So that's significant in itself. But in this case, al, short, 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 and then 10 instances of all. So that's not a surplus, um, uh, father anymore. That's um, a reference to the pronunciation. Not in the last even I meant to change that title. So it's um, these are just the abbreviations. And again, um, again, um, abbreviated forms that occur in the text are simply expanded. And Robin Flower didn't tend to use abbreviations unless the expanded form was obvious from the context. So in the case of an example like this, though, uh, this one here, the question of morphology comes up again, and that it's not clear from the abbreviation whether or not the narrator used the broad nominative form or the standard vocative form. So did he say a hyon or did he say a hyon? So what was decided in these cases was to use the most common form, but crucially, very crucially, to have the original form in a footnote. So that way, if someone in the future is to research the use of vocative case in the 1930s are in Irish, the footnote provides the information that this particular example cannot with certainty be counted as a vocative form. It was actually an abbreviation. Uh, likewise, this is just an example of uh, uh, pronounced as this, as this, as this, all the different uh, pronunciations, and that way it's easily accessible for someone looking for how any of these were pronounced. This is a, this is, um, a great example, though, because cop and is pronounced cop in, in Aran Irish, but according to the Irish of Uris Anya, in the case of Reem the Goth, and he actually Reem the Goth, he uses this example. Um, it's oftentimes in storytelling pronounced with an A, and in the manuscript, that's exactly how it is as well, pronounced with an A. These five occasions when it's encased in this, in Reem the Goth, every other time, or here Cop, and here when it's just quite cats not outside of the this character, it's pronounced with a U. I think that's a great example to show uh, Robin Flower's attention to detail. TH Laura, I'm going to leave um, some of these, just the legibility factor. Um, this sort of thing happened quite a bit, and that would, um, from the context, I think it was, it's either on or a niche, this, this kind of thing. Um, and they were just elongated, but mentioned, always mentioned that um, a decision was made to make this into a niche if it was obvious from the context. So this is an example then of Umbakach here um, and the edited text here on the right. I don't know how clearly that could be seen. Um, it didn't like being changed from a Mac into Microsoft Word. So I, these paragraphs shouldn't be here at all these spacings, but I can't remove them. Um, so, I'm going to move swiftly on so that I can um, get to the storytelling scene. The art of the folktale is in its telling. It was never meant to be written, nor to be read, nor to be studied by students interested in its linguistic content. It was meant to be told. 
and that's from uh, Seamus O'Dellaraga. He also says the real storyteller is a creative literary artist. No, sorry, my notes are that's where right here. So the preceding demonstration of the editing process and linguistic analysis takes the text artifact, that is the text preserved in manuscript form as a starting point of analysis. From a linguistic point of view, a text from some 90 odd years ago provides invaluable material for linguistic exploration in terms of a synchronic and or diachronic analysis of what's it on this dialect. In the remaining time, I would like to reconcile the flower um, reconcile the flower or Zidon collection with its Aran Island storytelling setting. Although this particular collection is as a result of a narration event between a storyteller and a folklore collector, Robin Flower, as opposed to the more common community event, the stories originated and grew out of a traditional setting and were subsequently recorded, committed to print, edited and presented in annotated form. Performance studies lends a performative and active aspect to the storyteller's role. Richard Bauman, drawn on the works of Goffman, and Bateson provides us with metacommunicative frames that serves as markers or keys to performance, indexes to performance, and highlights the collaborative relationship between narrator and audience in the performance setting. Through the presentation and interpretation of various keys to performance, both storyteller and audience are responsible for setting up the frame within which the ensuing speech act is to be interpreted. James Odilarga here refers to the storyteller as a creative literary artist, and this demonstrate that, demonstrates that narrators weren't viewed as passive conduits of lore in the way they may have been in the formative years of folklore collecting. In fact, the performance event was viewed as significant and worthy of description to the point that um, Sean O'Sullivan's Handbook of Irish Folklore, first published in 42 and was the go-to guide for all folklore collectors, offered the following guidelines give an account of the setting in which the story was told, what conditions were necessary on the part of the storyteller and the audience, describe the scene where certain stories favoured with both narrator and audience, give details, etc. What was the usual type of comment or interjection by a member of the audience? Um, now unfortunately, due to budget and time re restrictions, such information was rarely recorded in the field. And that's according to Briody, 2008. So the intention was certainly there. Um, but returning to this, the art of the folktale is in its telling. It was never meant to be written or to be read nor to be studied by students interested in its linguistic content. It was meant to be told. And many of us will never have the opportunity to hear a gifted verbal artist narrating in a traditional setting. We will instead read their stories in the form of annotated texts and that comment on everything from the morphology of the tales to the linguistic features of the narrator. But however, we are fortunate to have access to various accounts relating to the art of storytelling in the Aran Islands, which yields the following information. According to Zimmerman, the traditional time of year for storytelling in Ireland was from Halloween through until May Day. It would appear this varied slightly in an year of the Aran Islands where the storytelling season ended at Christmas in time for the recommencement of the fishing season in the new year. It was customary for people to visit their neighbours on these long winter nights, a custom known as Ornion, for the night to become one of storytelling, however, people either visited the house of a known narrator or another's house where a storyteller was known to frequent. The average audience was about 12 people, comprising mostly of men and older children, although the women and younger children of the hosting house were also present. The typical session lasted for a few hours from between seven and nine o'clock in the evening until midnight, and anything from a portion of a lengthy story to one or more shorter narratives were delivered on any given night. The same narrator might hold the floor for the evening or he or a member of the audience might call upon another to contribute once the story was completed. Neither food nor drink was served at these events but the host provided a pipe and tobacco that was passed between the men for the duration of the narrative. A seat to the right of the open hearth was reserved for the storyteller and the host or his wife would occupy the left-hand fireside seat. Um, Now, here we have some wonderful semi-fictionalized accounts by Pat Mullen, who describes our storyteller here, Dar Huzidon's fireside narration, and they corroborate the preceding accounts by Messenger, Becker, etc. So Hugh said, Pather, one Sunday night, how would you like to come up to Patch Fetos and hear Darren at a fatty, Darren's storyteller, the great storyteller from the West, telling a story. They say he is coming tonight. He is a man they call the cobbler because he learned to mend, store, to mend shoes when he was with the fairies long ago. What do you say? 
I never heard any of those old storytellers at it, said Hugh. I'd like to go very much. Yes, do, Vivek, said his mother. A dozen young men had already gathered at the feet holes by the time Hugh and Pather arrived. One and all had made themselves as comfortable as possible in expectation of the storytellers coming. They had taken down armfuls of dried ferns from the loft to lie on and were now stretched out at full length on top of the bracken. The feet holes sat in one of the chimney corners, the other being reserved for Darren Edifadi. Suddenly there came a rap on the door. He is here, muttered the men in hushed voices. This is Dara. Come into the feet hole. The latch was pulled and the storyteller came in, important and dignified looking. Hugh looked at him attentively. He saw a man of about 60 years of age with a fortnight's growth of beard on his face. He had twinkling blue eyes and wore a white bonnie. His vest and trousers were dyed a rich deep blue. He wore stockings and a pair of pamputis. His hair was rather long and was turning grey and most of it was covered with a very rakish and battered felt hat. A hundred thousand welcomes to you, said the Fito, sit in the corner there and make yourself comfortable. So these extracts wonderfully describe the social atmosphere and the air of excitement surrounding the arrival of the narrator. News spreads through the community that a storyteller is going to narrate that night. We notice that the narrator is not expected to perform immediately upon taking his seat by the fireside. Instead, he's allowed to transition gradually from his role as a regular, albeit high standing member of the community, Darren Adafadi, to his impending role as storyteller. A seat of honour is left vacant for the narrator, which he assumes upon entering the home, indicating that both he and the audience are aware of their respective roles for the evening, what Bauman refers to as keys to performance. Indeed, I was thinking it was for me the seat was left empty, he said as he sat down, and Tiffany's hat well back in his head, he warmed his hands by the fire. What news have you heard about? I heard you got a lot of flour at the time of the wreck. Next comes this customary discussions and relaying of local news that Messenger referred to. This allows the narrator to ease into his surroundings and prepare for his impending performance. And it also adds a further element of um, anticipation to the atmosphere. And this is the last of these slides. After about half an hour, Pather, seeing that the storyteller was in good humour, asked or said, Dara, you ought to tell us one of your old stories. Hugh here never heard the likes of you telling the stories of long ago. There are so many stories running through my head, he answered, that they are going astray on me. However, I may have one for you in a minute. He bent his head and covered his face with his hands and seemed to be lost in profound thought. Now I'll let you read the end of that yourself if you like, and I'll just say that eventually either the host or an audience member will put forward a request for a story and the narrator reluctantly obliges and the performance begins. And this was in fact commonplace for a storyteller to state that he must take a moment to recall a tale indicating to his audience that he was not eagerly awaiting an opportunity to perform. Messenger in his account from Inishir actually says um, he attests to this common tradition of displayed modesty prior to performance and says um, some narrators were overly eager and launched into their stories without being asked once the audience was seated. And this didn't go down very well, seemingly. Bauman actually describes this display of initial reluctance as a specific key to performance, which he calls a disclaimer. Um, in the last um, few slides here. Introductions as framing devices. I will just very quickly offer a few introductions and a few endings to the stories as I um, am conscious of the time. So Dara, however, seemed to, Dara, some storytellers use the more traditional opening sequences and very long, elaborate ones. Dara, however, um, tended to favor these less embellished and more straightforward openings that just place the character uh, geographically and temporally. So there was a man long ago, and he had three sons. There was a man in Oren, the old days, they called Sean Um, I won't go into this audience participation um, from concept of the time, but basically he occasionally stepped outside of his persona of storyteller to explain something. So explaining here that the chimneys in the old days were much larger than they are now. And that explains the reason why the boulder um, was able to fit down that chimney. The boulder was shot down to kill um, uh, the witch sitting by the fireside. So that didn't need to be explained because that's a normal occurrence in folk tales. But the fact that the chimneys were too small needed to be explained. Um, I have a few more of these and these are uh, meta-narrational devices uh, used to communicate directly with the audience. Again, these card machines are no longer around today. And he's explaining um, that they needed to be used the story endings. The competent narrator will execute the perfect story with ease, seam seamlessly stepping in and out of various roles through the employment of different voices. With each role change comes a change in footing and alignment to his audience.
During the course of a story, the narrator may present himself as recounter of events, as a character in the story, or while delivering meta-narrational comments as his non-storyteller persona. The engaged audience will pick the various voices without difficulty and follow the story in and out of narrated time as the storyteller intends. Of course, in the performance event itself, there will also be many paralinguistic contextualization cues, such as prosodic changes of tone and pitch, as well as gestures that will assist with the interpretation of voices. Zimmerman notes, for example, that the storyteller may enact his tale by impersonating the various characters, imitating their voices and using gestures. Given that these cues are un unavailable to the reader of the folktale, however, it falls to the collector or future editor of the text to delineate the various voices with the use of quotation marks and other formatting devices. So these are Dara on story endings, typical of his endings. There now is a story of the blacksmith. And there was the argument that transpired between Maud and her husband. And to be sure, if my memory serves me right, women are not to be trusted. And you imagine this is a perfect way to um, to ease into the post-performance scene where um, the men present would discuss this. Um, and then this is a lovely one. And they married and Dara Hudzidam from Olnacht was at their wedding. So he inserts himself into the end of the story. And I will leave you with a parting word from Dara Hudzidam as framed, remembered and fictionalized by Pat Mullen. And this is a perfect example again of the narrator transporting his audience in and out of narrated time and connecting both worlds through indexical positionings and changes of footing. So then said she, I shall come for you. My call shall reach you in the night wind. At this point in the story, the cobbler paused and Hugh asked a question. Did you ever see, did you ever hear her, Dara? Oh yes, she comes for me often, replied the storyteller dreamily. Ha, he whispered as he listened to the sough of the wind in the chimney. She is calling now, do you not hear her singing? Then in a low voice, he began to croon softly the song of the mermaid. Some day, said Dara with a whimsical smile, I may go to her, but as, as, it is, sorry, as it is late now and I have a long way to go, I will be heading for home. He got to his feet and opened the door. Then he turned with a smile. Good night, good night, he said. Good night and God bring you safe home. Iowa, as long a while ship. They shouted after him as he became lost in the darkness of the night outside. And with that, I will hand the floor back to you, John. Gurmila Magi. Gurmila Magi, Tane. Um, Avarian, David von Skyler and Aruna, and Ishtar Dahl, no Irias of Erreint, Gurmila Magi. Thank you very much, Marion, for that fantastic presentation um, with so many layers of information and detail present. I should have said to the audience that um, to put their questions in the Q&A, but we have a question in the Q&A already from Tomas Ohida, the father of Hamash. How are Dara Khodirain stories from Robin Flowers Nachla stored at the National Folklore Collection? Are they bound in one of the National Folklore Collection volumes or are they kept in a box or folder? Um, hello, Thomas. Um, no, so they're, they're not. They're um, two, two notebooks um, and loose pages. So the, there's one notebook that contains, they're, they're in two separate folders, folder five and folder eight. And they are the ones relating to the Aran Islands. The rest, I suppose, are to the baskets. And um, some of them are in loose pages. I think the ones in pencil, possibly, and mostly in a notebook. And then the second notebook is where he transcribes. He starts to edit the text himself. So in the second notebook contains five of the stories, five of the longer stories and they're partially edited by Robin Flower. Okay, that's great. So if anybody else wants to ask a question, please type it in the q and I'll just ask a quick question myself, Marion, while we're waiting. I presume the sound recordings are, are, are gone, are they? They were recorded um, on a netophone, I imagine, given the era. Were, were, well, was the... apparently not, apparently not. Now, Boo Anquist, I, I rushed through the talk and um, Bu Anquist was actually the first to mention in print, well, apart from one obscure reference before this, but in, in um, 88, I think, he was the first to mention the existence of this collection. And um, he said that they were recorded on Edifone. Now, Bedina Cohen at the time was searching for Ihan Khish for the film that was subsequently found. And he was talking to, um, to Robin Flower's daughter and asked her, if, his, if the father actually had an edifone in Aaron, and she said no. 
And I asked Boo Almquist and just one meeting I had with him before he passed away. And he couldn't tell me why he ever said that. Um, because there is no record, there is no record and uh, a recording of the stories in the folklore archives. And even though um, the practice was to record on the phone and then to, to clear them and, and to use them again, there doesn't seem to have been a recorded version. And that goes with the, the, the text to me, it looks as though it was written hastily, mm -hmm. written very hastily as, as the, the storyteller spoke. It didn't look as though it was recorded or written down from in a nice, nice relaxed position, writing from um, an Edifone recording. So I don't think there was ever a recording. It seems not. You think he was possibly transcribing by hand then in situ? My goodness. Yeah, that might yes. explain the illegibility. And we have a related question from your fellow islander, Deirdre Nith Nila. How much of the collection draws on Edifone recordings attributed to Flower? I imagine the machine in question was lent to him by the Folklore Commission. And then she says, an Edifone was used on the island as part of the effort to identify the ideal storyteller for the film. So there's a few things there, but I suppose Deirdre's mm. question about how much of the general request uh, um, collection draws on Edifone recordings? This I don't know. So Robert Flower's general connect collection, I take it. I haven't actually examined the rest of his material at all, which is vast, um, mostly relating to, to Peg. Um, I don't think um, a lot of that has been published either, a lot of um, Peg series material. So I think that would be the next logical step for sure is to, um, is to investigate that. And also, I'd love to um, to compare his um, the writing, his his penmanship from his iron work with that of the baskets. And I think that would be a, a fantastic comparison as well. And then I think we'd get some answers there to see uh, if there was much change in the in, in the writing in the in the presentation of it. Deirdre has just added another comment here saying that to date she doesn't believe any cylinders were attributed to recordings being made in Aaron at the time. Mm. So we have a question from Cassie Smith Christmas as well, who's a colleague of ours here. Um, I'm wondering if you could give a brief, a super brief overview of any of the particular linguistic features that jumped out at you as particularly interesting and or potentially divergent from Odirine's contemporary interlocutors in Inish Moor. Goodness. Well, um, the linguistic analysis is uh, 50 pages long and I think 300 subheadings. Um, so uh, to give an overview of that, let, let me just think. I think the, the TH, probably the, the missing TH um, in the middle of words, um, it was interesting bore. to me. Yeah, bore, it was mod, it was ad. And it was very interesting to me when I was reading the text that was that assisted me because that's my own dialect, of course. So when I'm Robin Flower would have something like he did a lovely sentence, which I gee it's a goal on e look, and he'd a gee I father, it's a goal on e you I father for e here a look. I said, oh yeah, yeah, that's what that says. <laughs> so it was um, it was lovely in that sense, and then having to elongate them and then to make them more standardised. So the um, missing medial th um, was very common. The Devoicing of um, the C, G, and B in the Mo Kunilach, I guess, so for the cats in the So I've got the Irish terms for the linguistic, the Irish linguistic terms. Um, the conditional terms, yeah. Yeah, there are countless of them. Um, and I, I haven't, I haven't, I didn't do a, a, a diachronic analysis at all. Um, but, and I actually didn't have access at the time to Seamus Zidon's fantastic work, which was published the same year that I, that I submitted, that I first submitted in 2015. Um, and um, then stuff my Bible in 2016. So I submitted it in 2015 and I, Seamus Zidon's material came out then as well. And that's a 1000 page document on the Irish of Aaron. So that wasn't available to me at the time. So I think, for, to answer that question, I would certainly need to look at Ozidon's work uh, to refer back to, um, as in Seamus Ozidon's work, to refer back to Dara Ozidon's dialect of the 1930s. 
Excellent. So we have a question from Alva Nikilachol in Limerick, Vajro to Alva. Mil Buichas as kind on Simuel Avarian. There was a reference to an abbreviation of AL to Aladdin. Were there many international and or literary tales in Darach's collection? Um, yes, so the AL to Aladdin, and that was um, Slavi and Lampa, was, was the title of that tale. And I, I do have a note. I was going to mention it actually the I think there was seven seven that can be attributed to the international um folk tales now um offhand I just okay yeah so um Rugach the glass is classified as the magician and his pupil 8325 um, Hoxian and Leshen Shunach um, is a fox plays dead or thrown out of the pit and escapes. And um, that's there. The election of the bird king is an international tale. And um, that's uh, Rina Nyan in this collection. The man who got a night's lodging is an international uh, heading, but it's on Thalier in, in this case. And um, the maiden who seeks her brother is actually here. It's untitled in Shkail Tzrichoshach. And then Aladdin. Is also mentioned um, Slavian Lampa. So um, they're the international there that they fit in the international classification of folk tales, those, those seven. Also some international motifs as well. Good. So we have a question from Melissa Engman who asks, who says that uh, she's curious about the storytelling season. What are the reasons for this? Simply practical concerns due to organization of labor with the changing seasons? Or are there additional beliefs associated with telling certain stories at certain times? And she says she's thinking about how this may or may not connect with storytelling traditions elsewhere that dictate which stories can be told when. Very interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, and I don't have an answer to that. Um, uh, George Zimmerman has written a fantastic, the Irish storyteller or the Gaelic story, the Irish storyteller. Um, so I can certainly give you that reference. Now he doesn't, I don't think he mentions the Aran Islands at all, but the, and Messenger, I can't answer that because it's not in the accounts relating to the Aran Islands. Um, so Messenger doesn't, doesn't, add, doesn't give an answer to that as far as I know, um, either does Heinrich Becker, um, who does talk about storytelling in the Aran Islands and, um, well, Pat Mullen also. But um, you may find an answer to that question in Zimmerman, which I I'm, can give the, it is, it's the Irish storyteller, George Zimmerman. Very good. That's great. Now, Deirdre Nicanila has another comment here saying that there are photographs surviving from the Mar Man of Aaron period showing people being recorded on site. Um, and she's a question as well. Do you plan to publish an edition of Darach stories and or the linguistic analysis? And would you do that together or separately? Um, separately, Deirdre. So the idea is for for this collection, and this is um, in consultation with the folklore department as well in UCD, that um, the collection is, is quite large and um, 60, we'll say 60 stories. So to translate both of those, I think it'd be two separate projects. So the idea is to produce the Irish stories as they are edited and annotated along with Odzidon's other stories that are preserved in the folklore archives. So I think there are five, six other tales by Zidon in the folklore archives, one previously published in Bielitis and the rest unpublished. So I'd like to publish all of those together, the Irish stories and the linguistic analysis, I think would have to be separate as well. So um, that would also, as I said, include um, have to, you know, apart from all the, the sources that I mentioned, the Irish of Urusanyach and Gwega Chasharig and all of those, um, obviously would include um, what wasn't available to me before and is now Seamus Odzidon's The Irish of Aaron. And then the English stories I would hope to produce after that. So the English stories would be down the line, a translation of, of Odzidon stories. Very good. And I meant to say that I was delighted to see Furashun Fokolos Gaia have mentioned in your list. It's a fantastic little book that's uh, often forgotten with the most unusual uh, examples of now Marabond dialects from East Galway and so on. Davio Cronin, Professor Davio Cronin is with us and um, Dershe Anachind, co Cohortchus. Sean O'Cronin, when collecting, when recording material in Moose Gree, used an edaphone for the longer big stories and commercial shorthand for shorter items. 
And he also says that Robin's Robin Flower's handwritten text looks like he was using a version of shorthand. Okay. So no question there, Marion, but uh, just a comment. And we have another comment here from Kelly Fitzgerald, who uh, says often the recorded edophones were not saved and were shaved after transcriptions were made. And indeed, that's a point made by Briodi in his book as well, I think. Yes. So thanks for that comment, uh, Kelly. So we don't have any other. Do you want to come back on any of those comments there, Marion? We don't have any other questions. If anybody wants to ask a final question, now's your chance because we'll be wrapping up shortly. Um, um, no, just in relation to, to the shorthand, I'd be very interested in, in learning more about that because um, I, I wrote my own sort of key, um, you know, that his, his, B, his BH looked like this and his DH looked like this and all of this. So I have my own key um, of Robin Flower's um, shorthand. But um, yeah, I'd be certainly interested in learning more about commercial shorthand. Okay, well, maybe um, you can get in touch or Davi can get in touch. So we have another comment from uh, Dirjani Khanila here. Taig S. Shoige used shorthand to, just, to transcribe folkloric material and song in Aran in the 1920s and 1930s. So that's great. Uh, so I think that brings us to the final, uh, to the end of our uh, proceedings today. Um, thank you very much to everybody who uh, came to our seminar today with a very engaged audience and um, especially to our speaker, Marion Nivoyalain, Gurumila Mahagatabari and Vian Chaint Gahuntuch. Um, and thankfully, the winds and the rain didn't interrupt our Wi-Fi connection between here and the Aran Islands. So um, I, I want to thank the Moore Institute as ever for hosting our event and especially to Matthew for technical assistance today and to the Moore director, Professor Dan Carey, for his ongoing support with CAM. And also, I want to remind you that on the 31st of March is our final um, presentation in the CAM lecture series, which is Dr. Dorothy Niegain from Akadov Nohotskalich de Gaelge, and she'll be talking about 20 years of the Common European Framework of Reference for Language Learning. And that will be on Thursday, the 31st of March at the same time, 4 p.m. So that's all from CAM today. Shine on Onod Om Hangolir Daimuch, Agus Eltankachus, Gurmida Mahagov, Agus Kadeshiv Slan.